So welcome to everyone who um, is on the Zoom meeting, our attendees and well as our panelists. Thank you so much guys for agreeing to share some of your thoughts and to our independent um, evaluators to sharing their findings from some of the work that we've been doing at Funda One Day. Um, we, do, we do plan to stick to time because I know sometimes with the Zoom meetings, it can tire people out. So we do want to remain within the two hour span. And like Phoebe has mentioned, we will leave the um, answering and question session at the end, uh, which Nabisa so will facilitate. But before um, we get going, I would like to just give a quick brief sort of overview of uh, what we've been doing and what we're busy uh, planning and activities that we are currently busy with. So I think in the past year, some of our greatest highlights at Funda One Day um, has been uh, the midline evaluation by Kelly, and as well as partnering up with the Eastern Cape Department of Education in um, their reading plan. And thirdly, um, is also launching a numeracy program that goes hand in hand with the literacy um, program that we have, which we call Bala One Day, and that is um, in well, in term one was launched in schools for grade one. Oopsie. And then fourthly is the um, review that Pamela and Catherine had conducted on our Reading for Meaning course that's um, at Rhodes. And the most recent um, activities that we've been working on is what we're calling the Reading Academy, which is a blended training course um, and the vision was this for during the lockdown per period that um, teachers can still have some sort of teacher professional development. Um, this is, we do plan to launch this next week. Um, it comprises of the three, what we, what we understand to be the three key components of teaching reading for meaning. And um, teachers can um, enroll in the course. Um, it's going to be on our website. Uh, if participants prefer having printed document, we'll also have those PDFs um, available for people to print and download. And I think more excitingly is the sixth one um, is we've been um, planning to also launch or to, to make available what we say is the reading sector bursary, um, offering up to about 20 bursaries for um, people, individuals that are interested in uh, professional development to take the course at Rhodes. And we will share more details and we will share the link to that with everyone that's on this call currently. So just a bit of um, sort of, not do's and don'ts, but how are we gonna do the um, um, webinar? Like I mentioned, questions and comments will be, will be kept for um, the last section. Um, attendees, your audio and video is disabled, but um, Nobisa and Phoebe will be monitoring the questions, so don't, don't hold back, send through your questions. And like I mentioned earlier on that, uh, just watch out for the poll questions that will be popping out throughout the presentations. Um, and I think now while Catherine and Pamela set up their screen, um, I'm going to stop mine and just to briefly introduce um, Pamela and Catherine are uh, at Harvard University at the Graduate School of Education. Um, and it, I think it's now, it was, it's been a year since your visit to Pamela and Catherine, um, almost a year um, in South Africa where they came and, and they visited some of our schools um, in Eastern Cape. And also we just gave them a tour around of what, we, what we're doing and show them um, our program. So, yes, over to you, Pamela and Catherine. Thank you. Much. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be in your company, even virtually. Um, it has been a while since we were together. Um, <clears throat> for better, <clears throat> for better, for worse, <clears throat> this pandemic has brought us together in unusual circumstances. Um, so we are glad that, um, and we hope that everyone um, you and yours um, are healthy and safe. Um, well, I also wanted to acknowledge the uh, worldwide uh, movement around Black Lives Matter. And this is very important to us here in the United States to finally find uh, justice 
um, as we purport to be, you know, for freedom and justice for all, it hasn't been quite that equal. So we are also uh, really addressing those uh, areas of inequality. And we feel that clearly having good education and for all, and it really comes down to good economic, educational, as well as health outcomes. So I wanted to acknowledge that and it's good to be in your company even virtually. Um, as uh, Mnamgamzo mentioned, um, Catherine Snow and I were asked by the Fundabande leadership to review the first six modules of the Rhodes Literacy Course. And so we uh, took on that uh, task gladly. Um, what we decided, however, because our Graduate School of Education is very connected to our students and very committed to them having real world, real world field work experiences, uh, we decided to recruit master's students. We just put out um, uh, an opportunity to do an independent study with us. And we thought maybe two or three students would um, be interested. And in fact, 12 master's students were interested in, um, in joining us in this review process. And they had uh, expertise, uh, language and literacy, curriculum design, technology um, and international education. So it was really a interdisciplinary review team of master students. And we actually had one student from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. And several of our students did have experiences in Sub-Saharan Africa. You, either they, their, their roots were there or um, they had spent time there. So they really did understand um, a lot of the um, educational and economic and access issues. Um, so we assigned um, each of the Rhodes courses to a team of two to three students. And we went through an iterative thematic analysis process. So each group looked at their particular um, module using the app as participants. And then we got together and discussed what they saw, what they found. And then we, through that process, we came up with these the focus areas of what was the content of each of the courses? How did the videos support the learning of the participants? How did the assessments help engage the participants as well as check for understanding? What was the general design? Our technology students were really into the design of the um, modules and the presentation. And how, what was the user experience? And after we got those areas, we really introduced um, Nell Duke's Literacy Essentials, which are available on that literacyessentials.org website. And Nell Duke is a uh, valued colleague and a former doctoral student of uh, Catherine Snow's. So that was basically our review process. Um, so as we want, think about giving you an overview, um, I'm sure you all have access to the report. We thought about two buckets to really focus in on, was the content of the courses as well as the user experience. You can have great content, but if the users can't access it easily, it's content sitting there. If you have a great user experience, but the content isn't worthwhile, then you're not meeting your goals of increasing the capacity of the foundation level teachers to be effective literacy instructors. So we felt that these two aspects um, of the courses were the most important for us to think about today. So we looked at the courses from you know, two stances. One was what worked well. So in terms of the content and the user experience, um, the content uh, what worked well with the content were that it was really, um, the content was really accessible and very well organized um, so that the participants really could feel that they were, were learning and they had a kind of the, that consistency. So there was a clear arc of learning and the process of learning um, was consistent so that the participants kind of got the, got the flow and could, could, could anticipate what types of activities were coming next. Um, clearly the um, content was based on very strong research and appropriate research. 
um, so that um, it really is a kind of a research to practice connection was made very strongly. The videos, you know, you know, Mpumi and, and Zaza, I mean, you know, and, and, and Primi, you know, who, who couldn't enjoy watching them teach, but not only enjoying watching them teach, that, that really was authentic, that they were in real classrooms with real teach students. It wasn't, um, you know, kind of a staged interaction so that the participants had a sense of what was possible within their home context. There were very helpful overviews for each of the modules and um, just uh, many, many, a plethora of useful resources and downloadables. So if you wanted background information, if you wanted uh, templates, lesson plans, activities, everything was available to the users. So there, there wasn't a lot of, okay, this is great teaching. This is how you should teach. Now go off and find what you need to actually do it. But it was really, kind of one-stop shopping, everything was there. In terms of the user experience uh, with the modules, um, there was a good helpful repetition of new information. So again, a lot of iterative and cyclical teaching, which really kind of grounded their knowledge base and then built on to it. Um, again, you know, the engaging videos that I spoke of um, really kind of made the learning enjoyable for the participant as well as modeling how they could be teachers. The frequent checks for understanding really kind of slowed the participants down, that they weren't going, okay, page, 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 done. But, uh, oh, okay, wait a minute, I need to stop and answer these questions, which will pause my thinking and make me really think about my thinking, that metacognitive stance. All right, what have I learned? How might I apply it to my teaching? rather than rushing through something and then at the end saying, hmm, now, you know, where am I supposed to go with this? Um, again, within each module, there was the effective uh, use of different presentation types. There were charts, there were graphs, there were text to read, there were interactive videos. So again, it, it kept the, the uh, user engaged. And there was good use of tables rather than being very uh, context dense there was a good use of the graphics and the tables so that uh, the, the t participants really won't, wouldn't go into overload, especially if the participants um, were using different devices. So it is available for tablets and phones and computers. And it shocks me that a lot of my students do so much reading on their phones. Me, I wouldn't need a telescope to see it, but you know, but it really does, um, you know, the, the graphics and the use of tables does make the content more accessible, especially across devices. So now I'm going to turn it over to um, Catherine. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I think Pamela and I are, have sort of typecast ourselves in these different roles. Um, <laughs> she was a cheerleader in high school. Um, <laughs> So she, she does a great job with the positives. And I have the somewhat more difficult task of talking about what would, what would be the ways in which these experiences could be upgraded. And uh, I think the very good news here is that the content upgrades the things that would be even better if they were changed um, in the, on the content side of things are less, uh, it's a less lengthy list than the user experience. and having been involved in online learning myself, I know that it, there are ways in which you can make access much easier that you don't always think of in advance. And so I know some of these user experience uh, bullets are already being addressed, but just what we had to work with last, um, last winter. Um, on the content side, we thought that module one, the CAPS module, had very useful information in it, but it stood a little bit apart from the other modules and a greater effort to integrate it and with the other modules would have um, improved the coherence of the entire six module sequence. Um, there were some topics that we noted were missing. Some of these may be missing because they're uh, going to be dealt with in, subsequent, in the subsequent modules, um, but we just wanted to note that uh, attending to home language support, 
is a very important task in, um, in a country like South Africa where the power of English to take over can often convince teachers to um, use more English in the classroom earlier than is, than is optimal for student development. Um, the issue of authentic assessment, how to do assessment in the classroom uh, in ways that are authentic and that don't interrupt um, instruction, but that support instruction using students writing, for example, and noting uh, where the different students are on a, a developmental trajectory of writing as one way of uh, being able to assess their literacy skills, their reading skills as well, their decoding skills um, without giving a test. Um, recognizing all the complexities of this, uh, of this hope, nonetheless, some attention to school home connections uh, and uh, the sorts of things that that, te that teachers could do to engage um, parents. And then the emphasis on more reading materials, uh, just uh, making, uh, putting pressure on teachers to put pressure on schools to make more varied reading materials available to students is one theme that would connect very strongly to the uh, research literature on promoting literacy. Uh, and once again, we recognize that this is not a uh, responsibility that can fall entirely on the Funda Wande shoulders, but um, it is striking how little research there is, <clears throat> how paltry the research base is for teaching um, reading, teaching decoding uh, the alphabetic principle, the way it's specific to Isikosa at, versus English. And, um, trying out different ways of using perhaps contrastive uh, instructions to make sure that when the children have learned to read in their home language, Isikosa, or some other language, that they can build English literacy on top of those skills rather than seeing it as something that has to replace those skills. Um, and then finally, the structure of the modules is somewhat uh, varied, the different modules, and we think it would be um, supportive to, to, the, um, to the learners if they really knew how much was coming, how many uh, topics are going to be addressed, and how many activities are going to be presented in each of the six modules. On the user experience side, um, uh, these, these even better if notes in a, some sense reflect uh, or mirror the what's good about it notes. There are lots, several modules in which the mix of text and video is, is a very uh, well designed. In some cases, there's text that goes on too long. And in some cases, the videos go on too long. The videos are wonderful and everybody loved them, uh, but uh, sometimes cutting them up into two or three segments would have improved their usability by highlighting the, uh, the pedagogical points uh, individually of the different segments. Um, there was a whole list of ease, user access issues that um, different uh, reviewers, different of our student reviewers noted on different modules and different pages that sometimes the reset buttons didn't work, that there wasn't a progress bar that would enable you to see how far you'd gotten and how far you had to go. Um, we think personally it's better if the assessments uh, uh, better pedagogically if the assessments are, are not so easily responded to, if people have to stop and think a little longer and maybe even, maybe even search um, if the assessment questions are on different pages from the answers. Um, we think it would be very much make the whole process much more usable if you had a single, uh, an option to download everything per module so that you don't have to download the downloadables individually, and if the videos were numbered sequentially. Um, a, a hot buttons, um, so that if there were a, a table of contents, for example, with hot buttons to the videos and to the, uh, and to the downloads and other resources, that would ease uh, user navigation around the, uh, the modules and make it easier to go back and find something that you really want to review or really want to show a colleague. Um, a glossary with hot buttons on technical words um, would help uh, 
accessing definitions. Um, and then two aspects of the user experience that we think could be improved to create more active learning. Um, one is that to develop more varied assessment types. And I realize this is a hard thing to do, uh, but it's much more effective to have assessments that are not just uh, true, false, and multiple choice. And um, it's possible to do that even in an online environment if um, attention is given to providing feedback that uh, is kind of generic feedback to, to the various possible answers. So um, thinking more open, open-endedly about assessment types has two uh, purposes. One, it is a better way of involving the learners in active thinking, but also it models um, methods of authentic assessment that they could perhaps use in their own, in their own teaching. Um, going back to the, to the chestnut, how we teach is what we teach. Um, I think one of the, uh, one of the, th things that could be improved here is that by virtue of modeling multiple choice and, and true false assessments, the teachers are not being stimulated to think about alternative assessment types that they could use in their own classrooms. And then an annotation option uh, so that uh, the learners could make notes uh, or keep connected an uh, annotations uh, linked to the modules that they're studying. Okay. Uh, I see that there's another bullet there, but I can't read it and I don't know what it is. So let's, I think that's enough, Pamela. Let's move okay. on to the next. Well, here we are. So we're not supposed to have questions and discussions now, discussion now, but as an active learner, you will have been making notes um, at writing down your questions, and we hope to come back to you at the end. Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot, Catherine and Pamela. Um, we've definitely learned um, from some of the feedback that we've received from the Harvard Review, and I know Sarah and the team has, has been working tirelessly to try and implement some of these changes. And the review uh, response came at a, at, a, at a good timing where we've just received news that the course has been accredited as an advanced certificate. Oh, so we, congratulations. We, yeah, we're definitely moving ahead and trying to make the course um, a better learning experience for all the participants. But up next is Mpumi. We've asked her to just comment on the, um, on the report and just a Bit of background for, for people who might not know Bumi. Uh, Bumi is with um, DBE and she's also doing her PhD uh, under the supervision of Professor um, Safar Svonneberg at um, Stellenbosch. She's also a non-resident fellow with the Center for Global Development where she uh, works to reduce global poverty and improves lives through innovative economic research. Thanks Bumi, over to you. Um, yeah, thanks for that introduction. Wow, working to reduce poverty is a lot. Um, <laughs> but yeah, glad to be doing this. Um, I enjoyed reading the report um, that was produced by Catherine and, Hub and um, Pamela with their students and just have a few comments um, to share with you. So the first thing... Oh. Uh, sorry. Yeah, there we go. Um, so firstly, um, I thought this would be enjoyed by uh, the Funda Wanda team um, who have been very brave um, to get this course evaluated. And I just thought it, it is appropriate to just applaud them for the transparency um, and for sharing and doing this. Um, universities require some evaluation, but I don't think they required an international university to review the course. Um, and secondly, to um, applaud Funda Wande for making both the course content as well as this review publicly available. So all of us can not only see the version of work they've done, but also see the critique um, that was um, shared with us this morning. So 
I think that is something to applaud. Then secondly, um, I think just a reminder to all of us about why we evaluate, um, the purpose of that, and why an evaluation of this course is important. Firstly, it promotes transparency, objectivity, and independence. Um, we can now reflect on the course, not because Funda Wande has told us they've put together a good course, but there is an independent, respected institution that has verified that. Um, and secondly, we are all well-intentioned. Many of our policies and programs, um, fortunately, still do not have the intended impact. So to assume that because something was well-designed and well thought out, it would be useful um, is flawed and establishing a culture of evaluation in that way is then helpful. Um, then in terms of limited human and financial um, resources, we need evidence to help our teachers decide how best to spend their time. They have a limited amount of time in pre-service um, and they have a limited amount of time once they've been appointed as teachers and they need um, a way to assess whether what we're offering them is useful. Similarly, there are financial constraints um, and this will not change probably in the foreseeable future. So we want to be investing in um, courses that will be useful for teachers. And then finally, um, this is not the first time there's been a course for teachers. Most of our teachers are qualified. And so they have received a formal education, but somehow that education has not delivered um, skills on how to teach reading, something we consider core. So I think it's, it's good to then evaluate these kinds of courses to speak to these things. Then what stood out from the Harvard review, um, a couple of things. The one is the review contributes to creating a culture of public accountability on literacy programs. There's also an explicit criteria that is stated up front. So we all know what we are evaluating and why we're evaluating it. There's also reference to theoretical reasons why specific aspects um, of literacy should be taught in this way. So the endorsement or the critique is backed up by research. Um, and the consistency in the approach of assessing all the modules makes it quite readable and predictable. I think similar feedback you've given on the course and how it could be structured um, in that way. Um, then secondly, uh, the review recognizes and grapples with bilingual education programs. Um, recognizing the context of South Africa and that it's the same teacher who teaches the African home language and English first additional language. And then trying to identify theoretical and practical ways to help a teacher bridge that. Um, I think especially in decoding and vocabulary. And finally also um, acknowledging the role of the existing curriculum so that this course is not happening in a vacuum um, and the very first point in the report is how CAPS could have been um, better integrated in this. Then the last slide, um, just I think it's also useful for extending our research base on reading programs. Um, and similar to the CAPS comment, it takes what has been accepted as international benchmarking pillars um, for reading, but incorporates them into a South African context. And again, um, validates that those are still the pillars that we should be working towards. Then there is um, good reaffirmation of contextual issues and um, opportunities where uh, the course could be strengthened. And I think that particularly acknowledging the oral um, tradition in South Africa was helpful. So one of the ideas that suggested in terms of how to get parents involved is firstly acknowledging our parent dynamic and um, potential low education levels, but then still saying a parent can speak typically and can tell a story to a child and that can be brought into the classroom for emergent writing or um, it, from the school, a, a teacher could do a family tree exercise and the parent would just help the child with labeling through um, the family's names. That is something that would be accessible to all parents across the sector. So that was a useful contribution. Um, I think something that is particularly unique about this evaluation as well is that we receive valuable feedback on blended learning for adults. Um, we, I think a lot of us, well, across the world expected uh, ed tech to have its moment during this pandemic. Um, we know it hasn't had its moment um, and in South Africa, definitely not for learners. But I think we're all recognizing the importance of establishing tech access for teachers. I think that is a, um, a, a something we can do. 
And I think reading up on the Fundawanda course, uh, realizing all the teachers that are um, enrolled have laptops at home, have data at home, have uh, the app that's been um, zero rated so that they can access it offline. That is the sort of hardware prep and work we should be doing in general for our teachers. But also more specifically here, there's been a lot of attention on the content of the app. So from a country that has vast experience in using technology for teaching, this is especially useful for us. Often our conversations end with the hardware and connectivity issues. We don't spend enough time on the pedagogically bundled technology aspects and the review does this really well. From design elements right through to the usability um, and interaction by participants. Uh, so Nick uh, had for many, many, many occasions told us how amazing the videos are. It's now official. We've heard it from you guys as well. Um, so hold on to Funda Wanda for that. Then finally, um, the review reflects a collaborative approach. So the diversity in reviewers, um, I appreciated that, including the capacity building component built into it by in including your master's students. I think this creates a bigger pool of people who could do similar work in the future, and we want to do that. Um, and it also shows a commitment to evidence and incorporating both theory and classroom practice because a lot of these students have been teachers as well. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Bumi. Thanks, Bumi. Um, so just to mention that um, Catherine and Pamela did only review the first six modules of the course and the reports for both the Harvard Review and as well as their evaluation is up on our website. Um, and the second half of the course is being taught this year. And the next six modules is teaching EFAL, um, creating culture of reading, inclusive education, and reading assessment and remediation, as well as planning and progress. So um, if you go onto our website, um, the full sort of range of modules and also possible dates of when these um, contact sessions will be held at Rhodes is available. So while we quickly do another screen change, I'd like to introduce uh, the next um, speakers, which is um, Professor Kelly Arnerton, who's a professor at UCT. Um, she worked together with Tian, who's an analysis at Genesis um, Analytics, and they worked on evaluating our um, evaluating our um, intervention that has been going um, on over a year now in the Eastern Cape, led by Zaza and her coaches. And she's up. Thanks, Kelly. Over to you. Um, okay, great. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, so what we're sharing today, um, we're very happy to share the results from the first year um, of a pilot intervention in the Eastern Cape um, of the Fundawanda uh, program and materials accompanied by uh, ongoing on-site coaching support. Um, sorry. Um, so, um, what happened was uh, Funda Wanda was um, in part was invited in partnership with the Eastern Cape Department of um, Education to pilot um, their program, um, and uh, Mpumi gave uh, a support for why we need to evaluate, and we were approached um, to uh, design an evaluation to accompany this pilot program, um, and the evaluation focuses on. Uh, the primary goal of Fundawanda, which is having all South African children reading for meaning by the end of grade three. And so specifically, the uh, evaluation is attempting to estimate the causal impact on the, pro the program on foundation-based ability, learners' ability to read with meaning. So the design of the intervention, um, we went through a process, Fundawanda went through a process together with the department where schools were invited to apply uh, for the program. And then amongst those schools that were eligible, we as the evaluators randomly split the schools into a group that was going to become the Funda Wonder schools to receive the coaching intervention, and then a group of control or comparison schools. And we went into those schools uh, in January last year, and um, 
we randomly assessed grade one and two learners in those schools. And then at the end of the year, we went back to those same learners and reassessed them. And the plan is to reassess those same learners at the end of every year for the next um, three years. And because we randomized, it meant that the two groups were very similar at baseline and that any difference that we see between the groups at the various midlines and eventually at the end line, we can attribute to the impact of the Kundu under coaching program. The schools are all located in the three urban um, districts of the Eastern Cape. Um, and in total, we have 59 schools and we are following uh, 10 randomly selected learners in each of um, grade one and grade two in those schools. Uh, at the end of the first year, we were able to successfully reassess 94% um, of the learners. So we're very happy that we have very low attrition of, of um, 6% and that we, we managed to um, reassess so many of them. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, morning, everyone from my side. Um, so this slide is just to give everyone a descriptive sense of what learning levels looked like for grade ones and twos at baseline when we started before the program started. And then also how this progressed over the year, but this is for control schools. So you can think of this as the, the business as usual kind of progress in learners over time. Just to give you a quick sense is the share of learners scoring zero. So if you look at the left, complete left for letter sounds, dark blue is at the start of the year. We see about half of the grade ones not being able to identify a single letter sound and at the end of the year, that's decreased to about one in 10 in the normal business as usual schooling environment. And then if you look there towards the middle where it says words, this is for word recognition, like familiar word reading. At the beginning of the year, uh, again, about half of grade twos couldn't read a single or identify a single word. Um, and the, towards the end of the year, it's about one in five. So that gives you a sense of the the normal business as usual reading progression. Then if we move to the next slide. Um, so here's just a look at how the average scores for grade ones and twos progressed in these control schools over the year. Again, we start off at the left and at the beginning of the year, grade ones could identify an average about six letter sounds correctly per minute. This was increased by 18 to 24 at the end of the year. And then again, if we move towards the middle where it says words, at the beginning of the year, we saw grade two learners only um, able to identify seven correct words per minute. This grew by eight to 15 by the end of the year. So this gives us a sense of the business as usual learning. I'll be referencing to this in a, in a second again. Then we can look at the standardized treatment effects. So here we're showing for the full sample, grade ones and twos. Just to give you a sense, uh, we tested a range of pre and e early literacy outcomes, uh, reading outcomes, everything from letter recognition to word recognition to reading fluency, reading comprehension, and so on. So the measure in the dark green bar towards the left is what we call this composite reading proficiency score. We would capture all these elements in one score. We look specifically at standardized scores here to make them comparable for the different domains. And we can see how big the effects were in each different domain. And something that's pretty striking and probably the big takeaway here is that there were positive impacts on all domains. It's pretty large and consistent effects. Now, as Funda Wande um, states in their own goals and also we as the evaluators, what we're mostly concerned about is reading comprehension. We see this as positive and significant at the 90% confidence interval. So I didn't mention this, but the dark areas of the bar is the 95% uh, confidence interval, and then the shaded areas includes the 95% area. But now what's interesting is when we look at grade two specifically, we had two uh, reading comprehension tasks that we tested it on, them on. We see positive and significant effects for them specifically at the 95% level on, on both these tasks. So how do we interpret this? For us, this is kind of consistent with the idea of a sequ sequential acquisition of literacy skills. So first, learners need these basic decoding tasks, then they can move on to reading fluently and accurately. And only when they can do that, do we start to expect to see an effect 
a large and significant effect on reading comprehension. So, okay, so what do these standard deviation effects translate to in practice? Remember from the beginning that I um, reported relative to a year of learning and control schools. Now, if we look here at the grade two and grade one and grade two task reported separately, to see how much additional that Funda one day learners gain over the year. So at the leftmost column, the letter sounds column for grade one, the control school learners improved by about 18 letter sounds over the year. So that's the status quo. Funda one day learners had gained an additional six letter sounds per minute over the year, or about a third of a year of learning. For digraphs and trigraphs, it's an even larger effect, about 60% of a year of learning. And then for, if we look at the grade two learners, these high order tasks like word reading and reading comprehension, we see about a quarter of a year worth of learning, or perhaps you can think of them as about a school terms worth of learning on these high order tasks. And now we'll move on to the distribution. Thanks, Kelly. We didn't practice this, but you're synchronizing pretty well. Um, so another encouraging finding from the Funda One Day program is that we see learning gains across the distribution. So here, each point for control and treatment school learners separately, we see the percentage of learners who could identify so many letter sounds, 20 or 40 or more at that point in the distribution. The pink line is for control schools and the Funda One Day learners are represented by the blue line. So as you can see everywhere, the blue line is above the pink line. So just in short, the summary takeaway, the program effects were positive across the distribution here when you compare the two. Another way to look at this is to compare the size of the impact relative to where learners reading proficiency was at baseline. Again, here at the left, left hand panel, we see the distribution of learning scores at baseline and how um, based on where you ranked in the percentile from one to 100, how big the treatment effect was. Again, the treatment effect, you see that it has a bit of a wobble, but it's basically positive and significant across the distribution. On the right-hand side panel, we also did this for learners based on where they ranked within their classroom specifically to see if the treatment effect was the same whether a learner out of those 10 we assessed was the worst out of the 10 performing or the best performing the most proficient. And a big takeaway for us here, these, why these results are pretty significant is we've, in previous research we've seen it's, it seems to be particularly hard for these structured pedagogy programs to shift reading proficiency levels for those kids with very low foundational skills. And that's definitely one of the strong findings of the, the Funda Wandu um, evaluation to this point. Now, next, we do have some suggestive evidence on why these results might be shifting. We, we try and um, tease out what might be some of the mechanisms at play. So we look at evidence across more than one indicator, and there's, there's three general suggestive findings at this stage. First of all, Funda Wanda teachers seem to be more tuned to the actual reading levels of the learners in their class. So this is both in terms of which learners the most proficient or perhaps the least proficient in their class, but also just on average, how many learners in their class can read a passage of a certain difficulty. Um, second takeaway is we could take advantage of the fact that teachers and classrooms in both treatment and control schools were given these um, graded readers in the beginning of the year. And then from the one day teachers seem to be to use these reading resources, these graded readers more often, and their kids cover more stories within these graded readers. Then a third finding is teachers also, uh, Funda Wanda teachers are also more likely to use individualized forms of learner reading practice and, and giving teacher feedback that's more targeted. With reference to this, we're specifically referring to uh, Funda Wanda teachers being more likely to practice group guided reading, or have their learners practice shared or paired reading. Um, just to give a, a final concrete sense of one of the, the little tests we did to tease this out. So this is uh, how we came to the conclusion that Funda Wanda teachers are better attuned to their learners' learning levels. So we asked 10, uh, the teachers in their class out of the 10 learners that we assessed, who would you say is the most proficient reader? 
And then we could compare where these learners actually ranked based on our assessments, our EGRA assessments. So the right-hand side panel shows for Funda One Day teachers where their most proficient readers actually ranked, and the left does the same for the control school. Um, control school teachers, and what you can see is that the Funda One Day teachers, their most proficient learners, were more likely to rank first, maybe second and third, but their distribution was also narrower. So, for example, compared to control school learner, uh, teachers, most proficient learners, they weren't ranking sixth or seventh, as you see in the control schools. Yeah, that's it from me. Thank you, Kelly. Passing to you again. Um, okay, I just want to finish off with sharing um, what the next steps are. So, what Tian was sharing with you is, is really suggestive evidence, some of it measured, um, but some of it uh, self reported by the teachers. So, our Next very important step was to do um, some in-depth qualitative classroom observations. Um, they should be happening fairly soon, but, but uh, you know, we obviously plans are all um, a little bit on hold and up in the air at the moment. And then, um, and that should help shed light on um, what is driving the impacts that we are starting to see. And then uh, at the end of this year, we had scheduled the next round of assessments, which we hope to see if these early gains that we're seeing compound um, and if we see more around reading for meaning. Um, we are also adding to the evaluation the Bala Wanda, the numeracy program. And then uh, a, a huge part of the sort of partnership between the implementation and the evaluation is very much focused on iteratively learning and um, moving towards generalizable lessons. So also next year, um, as Nanganso said, I think she said, um, we, uh, Funda Wanda is moving to uh, Limpopo, new province, new language. Um, also you looking at using youth as teaching assistants and workbooks. And so that will be accompanied by an evaluation too. And we will be able to take the ongoing learnings from the Eastern Cape and uh, start to feed those um, into Limpopo. Um, and so, um, as Pumi again, as Pumi said, um, there's been a scarcity of evidence of, of what's really working and why it works and where it works. And um, so, what we're seeing here, which is um, particularly with the DBE's early grade reading studies, that Funda Wanda is now adding to this. Um, body of knowledge showing that these structured pedagogy pro programs with ongoing on-site support are effective in uh, shifting both classroom practice and learner outcomes. And we're starting to see that this is consistent across provinces, across languages, with different um, implementing institutions. Um, and just to say that the results that we're seeing in Fundawanda are very much in line with EGS, EGRS results on aggregate. Um, at this stage, it seems that Fundawanda uh, seems to have an effect for learners at the, at the bottom end of the distribution. Um, and this is something we will continue to explore um, as we go on. And that's, that's, um, that's us. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly and Tian. I think I think for us as an organisation, what um, the report from Kelly and, and Tian has definitely um, reminded us reminded us that it takes time to shift practices and, and and learning outcomes, and it's definitely what we're trying to do is is long term, um, and and as an organisation, we're quite committed um, in this long term change or shift in, in, in reading in African languages. So while we get ready to introduce um, our next discussant, which is um, Dr. Uh, ben Piper, um, who was previously the chief of party for the Tsusome, a scale up national literacy program based on the RCT. Um, he is also the senior director of Africa education for RTI and based in Nairobi. And ben, um, Dr. Ben Piper also sits on our board um, because uh, Funda Wanda was recently um, registered as an, as an MPC. So he sits on the board together with Professor Suze uh, Mabizela, Vice Chancellor of Rhodes, um, Maya, Maya Kanji, and as well as uh, Mr. Anthony Farf, um, the CEO of the Alan Gray um, Endowment. 
So over to you, Ben. Thank you so much. Uh, nice to be on this call and quite exciting findings from Funda One Day. Um, as we've just discussed, uh, my, my work has really been focused from here in Nairobi on working on improving learning outcomes at large scale. So I've been supporting programs in large scale implementation for a while. And I'm currently um, doing a study or uh, leading a study, a principal investigator of a study uh, called Learning at Scale, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation through CGD, which is looking at identifying eight large scale successful programs in the world. So a lot of my comments are related to, to those findings, initial findings, uh, as we're moving uh, through the program, through that research. I'm currently here uh, with you instead of being at a protest at the US Embassy at the moment. So this is my way of protesting how uh, people of color are treated by working on uh, with you on improving learning outcomes at large scale uh, with Funda One Day. Um, so just to just start off by saying that this external evaluation I thought was quite well done. So there are some of the positives that are, are related to it. It's a longitudinal study with within child design with strikingly low attrition. I've led some longitudinal studies myself in this, this part of the world and to have 6% attrition uh, a longitudinal study is, is quite exciting. Um, and I think the, the level of detail and external evaluation is quite well done. So that makes my job as a discussion a little bit more difficult than normal. Uh, so I'll actually spend more time talking about some of the implications of the findings rather than critiquing the study itself. I did wanna make two comments though about the study itself. First off is that the, just the, the, the implications of this study being one where we're looking at a pre-selected group of schools that were interested. So as the, it was briefly discussed in the, in the evaluation discussion, um, the, this is not your typical control group. So you're seeing the control gains, but there's reason to believe that schools that were interested in being in, involved in a Funde One Day implementation would be different than the average. So I want us to consider that. The second thing I want us to consider is the, the, the utilization of only urban areas as a sampling frame with respect both to external validity, as well as the usability of the results given the preponderance of rural schools across South Africa. So love to hear more about that. So what I'd like to do in these comments as a discussant, because I'm the one keeping from you, you from getting to ask questions of the other participants, I just want to ask three main questions. Number one, are the impacts large enough, right? So it's exciting to see 0.17 standard, de standard deviation effects. The range is pretty substantial from 0.11 to 0.22 on average. Uh, from a substantive point of view, that means it's about one or one and a half correct words per minute gains on oral reading fluency for the grade two kids. And as we heard about six letters per minute for, uh, for grade one. And as was discussed, it's quite similar to the year one of the early grade reading study. And I think that's useful. It shows that in South Africa, there's, there's space for improvement. The, the country is ripe for making changes in, in foundational literacy and numeracy that are gonna have impacts. I, I, I wanted to compare that to a recent paper by World Bank uh, by Graham and Kelly, which doesn't have um, kind of substantive comparisons, but it does says, say on average for medium size or large scale interventions, the, the impacts are around 0.44 standard deviations compared to 0.17. Now, I know having heard uh, the Funda One Day team respond to these findings, they're expecting them to grow over time. So this is, this is the first year of implementation, the first less than 12 months of implementation. But it is worth noting that we do need to have increases in learning outcomes if we're able to really help these kids. It, if you look at it from a substantive point of view as well, there's a paper that I worked on on some of the RTI implemented or other uh, USAID or different funded large scale programs, which showed on average the total gains with respect to learning uh, uh, improvements in oral reading fluency around six words a minute. Uh, and on average, those are about four words per minute per year. So while the gains we're seeing in Funda One Day so far are impressive and useful, and I'm excited about them as a board member, they're not yet enough to get South African children where they need to be. So the, it brings to me the bigger question of, how do we increase the impacts? And by the way, these other studies I'm citing, those are not large enough gains either. Increasing reading fluency by four, uh, six words a minute or four words a minute per year is not enough to, to reduce or eliminate the, the, the learning gap that exists for the poor and marginalized. So my first question was, are the impacts large enough? The second question is related. 
when we think about scale, what will happen to Funde Wande's approach as we're moving to scale? So I know right now the purpose of this is to look at proof of concept in these study schools, but really we should be thinking about what's different when we work through government systems, particularly for coaching. I saw someone asking a question about this very, very topic. How can the level of coaching that Funde Wande is giving that's really essential, it seems like, to the gains, how can that work inside of government systems beyond these kind of proof of concept how can the team find a way to test the ability of these approaches to work within those systems even before it gets to a scale up? And how do we deal with the fact that the Funda 1A teams are, seem like substantially talented and uh, quite effective, both leaders and technical experts, but how do we work in a situation where right now there's quite a bit of heavy touch from them and what will be different when the touch is much more diffuse? And similarly, what will be different at scale when the, the impacts are both expected on Isukosa and other languages as well as English uh, as a first additional language. So that was the second question, what will happen at scale? And the third one is how do we increase implementation? So I am positing that maybe some of the things that could be focused on from a Funde Wande point of view is how within the program right now, we can increase implementation as kids go back to school. And the research that we've done internally at RTI, the main, and actually the research we're doing in learning at scale, which we, where we found eight large scale successful interventions, but we surveyed the low and middle income country research of over 200 studies that we were aware of or that we found in the process. It seems that one of the biggest differences between programs is not only whether the materials were good, but whether those good materials were used. The implementation fidelity, the implementation utilization, the teacher take up, the likelihood that a typical teacher in a rural setting is going to use the program is one of the main determinants of how successful the program is, not just whether the materials are good. And I would say that my view of the Fundament materials is quite similar to Dr. Mason and Dr. Snow's. I thought they were great. I mean, from my point of view, they're some of the best I've seen. The readers, the lesson plans, workbooks, videos, the materials the different types of coaching and training and the face-to-face -face training. But I guess here's my provocative question. Are there too many materials? If we're thinking about implementation and the percentage of teachers who use it as a key determinant of whether or not the program works, might there be too many things going on? And here's why I think that's a reasonable question. If you put the programs that we reviewed for learning a scale and actually we're studying for learning a scale on a, on a continuum, complexity is inversely correlated, at least to some respect, with implementation utilization. So the complex programs that Dr. Snow and uh, Mason might be happy with <laughs> from a technical point of view that are doing all the sort of things that an effective literacy program should do, might they be also ones that seem overwhelming for an average typical teacher? Uh, how frequently, and maybe this is a question to Funda one day as we're thinking about looking at the implications of this study for your, for your work going forward, are you able to measure with some reliability and frequency how frequently teachers are using the materials? What's the kind of typical implementation level? How do we get, again, on a daily basis, a regular teacher to use the materials consistently? Not only are, you using, are they using the kind of the, the stuff for the classroom, how often are they using the videos, or using other, other content? So I guess this brings me to the, the kind of key point I wanna, I wanna end under this bigger bucket of questions is what are the critical elements of the program? If, if, if you had to, if, you know, if your board said today, you have to reduce some of the things that you are gonna use in the program, what would you do and what would you let go? What, might it be actually that reducing some of the program's expectations on teachers' ability to use a multiplicity of materials in one lesson, might it be that reducing that could increase fidelity? Might doing less of all of these very good things increase the number of teachers who use the core things? And here's my question to you, what's extraneous and distracting and what's fundamental to the program? And maybe focus on what's fundamental and do that even better as we move forward. The fourth question is kind of a, a cheeky one, add, adding another, another little point in here. How do we respond to COVID-19 in this situation? Obviously, we know that the learning loss will be, and in the South African case, has been substantial as you go back to school. We've done some analysis on that, plus um, data sets that we, we have from learning outcomes. And it looks like 
many of the gains at the bottom of the distri distribution might be completely lost given this duration of, of time away from school. And so what's Funda Wande doing and the government doing to help them catch up? What are the ways you can use tutoring or target literacy and numeracy support to help reduce those gaps? And how can we focus more of our energy? We've done so much in the sector trying to measure, even us, <laughs> measure how, what the magnitude of, of the loss might be and doing a lot on e-learning. But I think the real best investment right now would be to focus on catch up, helping those kids at the bottom of the distribution. And maybe as you think about what those areas might be, could that match well with what your team, the Funda Wande team thinks is fundamental to impact? So I'll, I'll, I'll end there. Thanks so much for the organizers of this and for the evaluation team to, for putting together a, a great study uh, looking at the impacts of the program. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. It seems like you've left us with more questions that we need to go back and, and, and think about and try to answer. But um, I, I know that to answer your very last question in regards to what is Funda Wanda currently doing in response to COVID-19, um, Zaza and her team, as well as Ingrid, who's heading the Bala Wande, the numeracy intervention, have been working uh, together with parents and developing materials for kids to to, to do at home whilst they are, are while schools or at least while now they haven't been back at school. So, and, 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 I, and there are plans in place that when the learners return to school, the, well, the foundation phase learners return to school, um, how our coaches will help or how they will support teachers um, for the loss of learning during this time. In regards to the scalability one, I think um, this brings us nicely to our next speaker, who is um, Tepo. Tepo is the chief, um, chief director for strategic planning and monitoring at EC, ECDOE. Um, uh, we've, we've been in lots of conversations with Tepo, trying to grapple with this. How do you, how do you scale up um, the Funda One Day program? Um, so Tepo, I'm going to quickly just hand over to you, and you can share your screen um for your presentation thanks Tsepo. okay thank you i'll do that just now uh good 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 afternoon to my uh, colleagues here uh this part of the country and good morning to my colleagues uh that side uh other side of the atlantic and i really want to appreciate the invite from uh from funda wande team and for us, really, it's an honor. And I want to also repeat, indeed, what Benjamin said to the team, that well done, and well done, and well done, and really keep at it. Uh, thanks for the intro, Nangam. So although I think I'm a bit now, <laughs> um, I'm not sure now, because Benjamin left us with some heavy, heavy questions. And I yeah. see you took that, and then you put it on me. I'm not sure if I'll be able to answer that. <laughs> But what I will share with all of you is really uh, in terms of what um, we believe as a country, we wish to see our basic edu education sector look like at least uh, years from now, uh, a decade from now and so on. And also to share with you in terms of what have been decided on as the priority in terms of um, the education sector in South Africa, and that's been led by our His Excellency President Ramaphosa as well. And I'll also share with you in terms of what we've done ourselves as a department, in terms of some of the things that we've picked up from the work that uh, Nick and the rest of the team are doing on the ground, and that we've, that we've started to pick up a little bit on that. And finally, I'll just share some of the, my own observation in terms of the work that's being done now and uh, also the issue of scalability as well. I think it's a tough one, uh, not very easy to do, but uh, of course, uh, I think it's, to, um, it's not always easy to know, as Kelly said, what is working, where it's working and, and why it's working, but it's really a learning by doing kind of process. So let me move on to the first slide, but before I do that, I know Benjamin did indicate that he is protesting uh, online being here with us. Thank you for that, but really to also share and indicate to Benjamin, Catherine, and Pamela as well that indeed uh, the fight for justice should be supported. It must continue and we are all, we are all of us in this together. Uh, having said that, let me move on to the first slide. Now this is in essence what we believe is a country we should be able to see happening in our education system. 
We want to see each and every learner benefit from really high quality learning environment. And we also wish to see our learners as we'll be able to, to perform better or at least be able to compare, to compare just as well with learners elsewhere in the world. And also we want to be able to revamp our system such that we're able to produce uh, highly skilled individuals who are able to compete not only here in the country, but anywhere in the world. So that's the kind of vision that we have for our country. And we also recognize, and I think also it's been one of the key drivers that led to the even conceptualizing and also initiating and the founding of Funda One is itself, that we want to see every uh, of our fellow countrymen and women be able to participate fully in a democratic society. And key for that, of course, is having a very um, solid um, educational foundation system and also that they should be able to, uh, to participate in actively in society as well. And we're also aware that of course, once we get this right, it's, it's probably one of the most important investment that we can make as a country, um, which includes of course, uh, really revamping and uh, scaling up in terms of our offerings in our education system. And to be able to ensure that it is not only once off, but it's of course, uh, lifelong as well, it's continuous. <clears throat> and also uh, it will be rolled out al alongside what we want to see happen in our innovation space. Now, just initial comments in terms of the work that's been done by the team, especially with regards to the evaluation itself. We like to really state upfront that we, we, we support the work that is being done by the team. And also um, you being a uh, part of our research co component here, it has really benefited not only our educators, our subject advisors immensely in terms of also how they think and their whole approach to how do you actually effectively teach reading for many. And we also welcome that the, the work you've done also really links quite explain in terms of what could be the policy implications that emanate from, uh, from the evaluation itself. And you also we welcome that you were able to include and indicate, okay, at least some of the measures that would be, this is what you need to, to be able to measure for what it means for reading for meaning. We also welcome the methodology, of course. And also from our side, we are really um, interested in terms of some of the impacts that you, you, you have seen and, and that you are seeing across our course distribution of uh, the baseline reading proficiency as well. And of course I did indicate it's really an honor and we do, th we, we do thank you that we are part of this, this discussion. Now just to move on. So in my intro, I did indicate that the president has really taken on board um, this initiative and has really made it, made it his number one priority because it like to see all our children being able to read for a minute. That indeed in January of this year, he declared to the uh, basic education Lekotla we had in Johannesburg that this is the apex priority of government for at least the, the next five, five years. Now, having said that, of course, uh, one of the first things you do is to come confront the problem as is. What we do know in many of our schools is that, especially at foundation phase, we do still have a problem of having large uh, class sizes. And also, we do have a problem in terms of um, a lack of educational re resources, especially uh, in our African la la languages. And this is compounded across, because if you're to work into any bookshop anywhere in the country and you look for a book for your kids, whether in Kosa, Zulu, Tswana, so on, so on, it's, it's difficult to find them. And we also know that because of our own history and the legacy of where we come from as a country, that a lot of our teachers as well have not been sufficiently capacitated with the specialized knowledge to really help them to be able to teach um, read, uh, reading for meaning quite effectively. And we also know, of course, that with this not being in place, it can really disadvantage a lot of our, um, a lot of our children. Now, Recognizing the problem as is, of course, what do we do? The first thing, of course, we need to address uh, the issue of class sizes. And I must admit, we've been quite successful in this, that we, at least for even the past two years, 
We don't have clusters in the foundation space that exceed um, one is to 30. So there's, there's a lot of work that went into that, but um, we have seen a uh, positive response from our schools in particular and really want to congratulate them for that. And also in partnership with uh, Funda, Funda Wanda as well and various other, other partners that they've been able to be able to support our teachers in terms of obtaining some of these qualifications and also provide ongoing support to them. And fortunately for now, what we've been able to do at a very cost-effective way is to be able to provide each of our grade R to grade three with readers to be able to take home and really enjoy uh, and spend time with family and be able to read actively every day for as, uh, for as, um, as long a time as possible. Now, in terms of the study itself, I know Kelly, when in the actual slide presentation, she, she referred to the uh, study as referring to impact evolution on in-service teacher development. But of course, in the report, it says actually it's a coaching intervention. But of course, as you go um, through the report as, as, as well, it refers to, to uh, the other components that would include LTSM and so on. So it's just a question, I'm sure this is, uh, it, it, it should not be a difficult question, that what are we evaluating exactly? Is it only the coaching component or is it the um, multiplicity of the, the whole intervention package that has been rolled out? So it's just something for uh, the team to consider there. And also we'd like to just find out some of the specifics in terms of what is happening in the control schools themselves, but I know Diane did touch a little bit on that, but we're really be interested in some of, identify some of those exact schools and see why are there any that have been able to, to really show improvements without necessarily having the Fundawande intervention. So those are just some of the details we'd be, we, we, we as a department would be very much interested in. So that's what, that's the second one. And then the third one, we really support the work that is be, being done and also support the way forward proposed in the report itself. And I believe this links to the closing comments of Kelly uh, earlier in terms of they are quite aware that it's, 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 it's early days, uh, the outcomes and the results so far are pretty suggestive and some more work needs to go into really in-depth um, qualitative observation. So we really we, we welcome that, but we do believe this is really empowering all of us uh, policy makers and those who are tasked with implementing the policy as well. And of course the researchers as well to really get to understand more as, as much as they are concerned of, okay, if we are able to observe this, are we able to scale this? Or even as Benjamin correctly know, know, know that are these impacts we're seeing actually big enough. So that's for the team to consider there. And of course, um, cost is always, as, uh, is always an issue. Um, as we know, we, we, we do uh, continue to face limitations in terms of the budgets available as the, the economy of the country, especially development countries in particular have been quite hard hit. So re resources remain quite a challenge. So Given that that is so, it would be interesting to really explore options as far as possible. How could scale? Up, how could we be able to scale up and yet remain cost effective? And um, I know Mpumi as well did refer to some options available um, in terms of uh, te uh, technology methods and so on. But given the coaching intervention, also integrating that with in terms of our subject advisors as as well. How are we able possibly to empower them in a way that is not, um, is not really and would not be at high cost to, to, um, to the department. But um, overall, the positive initial project uh, impact implies that the next steps include to carefully document exactly how the, the program was implemented in practice and also to explore, of course, uh, some cost effective options. And uh, okay, that is just for me to really share with the colleagues that uh, the work we're doing now 
it might not be easy or even clear cut to see exactly uh, what are the outcomes, but if we begin now with the hard leg work, we should be able to sum up the outcomes possibly 10 years from now, 20 years strong from now, but the work must start now and this is really important work and it is fully supported. So I wish to thank you so much. Thanks Sepo, thanks a lot. Um, and also thank you to all um, the presenters today. I know for Pam and Catherine, I think it's like they had to get up 3 a.m. this morning to, to join us on the call. And obviously we value, um, as an organization, we do value feedback um, for our friends and family, what we call for Nawana friends and family. And all of these reports are, are available on our website. Um, and I can also see that the chat box is slightly getting heated. Um, and I think um, participants will be, um, will be happy now that we're gonna move on to the last bit of the session. Uh, my colleague Noabisa, who is heading up the Limpopo intervention, like Kelly mentioned, um, is going to be facilitating the questions and comments. Um, yeah, so over to you, Noabisa. Thank you. Thank you, Nagamso. Um, yes, the um, chat has been uh, quite vibrant, and um, I'd also still encourage people to still add. Uh, post their questions on the chat. Uh, just to quickly kind of give you a roundup of the questions that have been asked so far, is that, you know, Fatima asked to everyone, can the intense coaching implementation, intense coaching be implemented through Fundawande, be replicated or scaled? And there, both Nick and um, Bumi replied with that, you know, Yes, it would be possible for you know government to scale this, but it would always be limited to priority schools. This would be both for the inter, uh, EGRS intervention as well as the Funda One Day model. Another question that was asked uh, was that um, from Sam was you know based on the research, how long does it take for the training and the teacher? for the training the teacher receives to start having an impact on learners' competencies and performances. And there the answer was, well, it seems that the impact can be measured from the first year, um, but you know, of in this um, subsequent years, um, if there seems to be a broader, more consolidated you know, uh, impact, whereas it is very limited to select subcomponents in the first year. So uh, there's a question here that has not been answered, and I think it uh, applies more to Kelly. Um, where Nanko Bella asks, Kelly is Ardington's conclusion that Funda One Day is the only intervention effective at the bottom end of all learners is very powerful. But how can they, or how do they arrive at this conclusion? So Kelly, would you have an answer for that? So, uh, the, the figures that Tian showed you, um, we investigated whether um, the impacts, so initially what we look at is the average impact, and then what we did is we investigated what the impacts looked like across the distribution. And so Tian showed you three different ways of looking across the distribution. Um, one based on performance, at the midline and seeing that at every single, at the, if you took the bottom 25% or the middle or the top, that the under wonder learners were doing better than the learners in the control schools. But then also importantly looked at, if you looked at learners and how they were doing at baseline and then looked at what the impact of the program. So you compare learners in control schools with learners in treatment schools who were doing poorly at baseline, and you see, well, what was the impact of the treat of the Funda Wanda intervention for those learners? And then you can look at learners who are in the middle, and you can look at learners who are in the top. And so then what Tian was showing there is that you were finding similar, those effects were all the way along the distribution of baseline schools. And then the final thing he showed was that if you put everyone together from all the schools and look, their distribution by their baseline scores. But what you can also do is you can look within a classroom and you can say within the class, is it the better kids or the weaker kids or who, who, is, who is benefiting from this program? And what we were showing there was 
that it didn't matter whether you were ranked weakest or middle or highest in your class, by the measure that we, the assessments we did, you, the effect when we compared you um, uh, with the control um, learners was there for learners at, at, at all of those points. Um, it would seem in terms of the, what we were able to find um, evidence on is that uh, um, quite a few programs do struggle to um, find a fix at the bottom end of the distribution, that the very weak learners um, are, it's harder to shift. Um, I hope that's answered your question. Um, Thank you, Kelly. Um, we also have another question from Nikki. And um, the question there is, when does the DBE move from support to consequence management of teachers who are not facilitating the delivery of literacy? What role are subject advisors playing in monitoring? Uh, surely this is the only way that any intervention can be really scalable and sustainable. Um, for that one, uh, it would be between um, Momi and Tsepo. Uh, would Tsepo like to answer that and then maybe Momi can follow up? Okay, hi. I, I, I did not get that. Eh? Please just repeat that. Okay. When does the DBE move from, um, from support to consequence management of teachers who are not facilitating the delivery of literacy? What role are subject advisors playing in monitoring? Surely this is the only way that the, any intervention can be really scalable and sustainable. Okay, no. Uh... Thank you for that question. Although um, it would have been preferable if DBE had started, as they said, uh, the policy. But uh, let me proceed nevertheless. I believe it's quite important to really recognize that the first step, we need to support our teachers. Many of them work in really tough conditions, uh, face a lot of um, really challenging circumstances given not only where we come from but also given the abject poverty and really pure uh, pure limitation in terms of resources and so on in many of our communities so i believe that is the first thing to do to really be able to how do we support our teachers better and once that is in place i believe all other forms of of course ensuring that indeed those who are tasked to be able to complete certain tasks and so on, do indeed do that, which is really a managerial function. And I do not see it impossible from happening, but I am not so convinced that if that support for teachers in, in particular, it's really where we'd like for it to be. And one can even say, hence even programs such as the one we have now in place in terms of uh, the Funda one, the coaching intervention, which is also in response to it recognizes that these are the circumstances that have been faced by many of our educators in the past. Um, so how do we turn around all of that to ensure that the learners currently in the system are able to benefit from really quality teaching and really also conducive and um, really supportive schooling environments as well. So I believe that's the first thing to focus on. Um, and then after that, other areas of, of course, management and supervision should be able to come in then. Uh, I'll stop there, thank you. Okay, I'll go ahead and um, just add to that. I think um, Tepo I spoke about um, teachers and, and their quality. I think the longer term answer is getting better teachers produced in the system. So from our higher education institutions, um, I think I mentioned earlier, most of our teachers are qualified. So as individuals, they have um, met the obligation to go and acquire a degree before they became teachers. We are having conversations now, which I think are important about what is the content of that degree? Why do these teachers who are qualified still not, why are they still not able to teach? 
And I think work is being done with DHEAD on that. Um, the JET Clearinghouse website has a lot of information about that whole work under PrimTED for the foundation phase. Um, and I think we've seen in recent analysis of international assessments, so within the past five years, that the newly qualified teachers are teaching better than the, the, the older teachers that are currently in the system. So I think pre-service um, work needs to be done for that. But I think from all these interventions and maybe a, a point that Ben um, raised is how slowly change is happening. So I think Fatima said the Funda One Day model is intensive, which I agree with. But even then, the gains we are seeing are not catching. It's not that the Funda One Day learners are a year ahead of control group schools. So I think for all of us, um, a sense of how long change takes, um, that, that's a conversation we need to have. How quickly can you um, improve the system by supporting a person in a quite intensive way through a coach? Um, yeah, I think that's still something to be spoken about. In terms of subject advisors and their use, I agree um, there could be um, more done about their distribution and what they do in terms of the support they offer. I imagine that they started off largely intended to play a curriculum support role, so similar to what the coaches in these studies are doing, but that seems to not be the case across the board. Why is that happening? Which provinces are more successful? and less successful on that, that is work that's important. Um, and I think a, a final point on that question is that this is a, you are, this is also a political question, right? So you are asking about um, punitive measures for teachers that involves labor and trade unions. And we know that in South Africa, um, there is a political conversation that also needs to happen around that, aside from the technical responses I'm giving here about um, the role of teachers or subject advisors. Thank you, Mbumi, uh, for that. Uh, I really liked um, the comment that you had, you know, with pre-service, because it links very nicely to the question that Suret posed on the chat, where she asked, what would the possibilities um, be to roll out the underlying principles of Funda Wande pre-service to teacher training institutions. I think a big problem is that teachers qualify, but once in employment, they start unprepared and bad habits are only perpetuated, which becomes all the more difficult to change the longer they are in the classroom. So for that one, um, I think this is a question that can be co-answered between government and Funda Wande. So um, would someone from Funda Wande like to answer this? Perhaps Nanga Muso? Hi, Noah. Why did I know that you were going to direct that question to me? <laughs> um, I'm just quickly just rereading again Surat's question. I think um, it, I mean, yeah, it's a very difficult one. Um, and, and I think we see our, um, our role as Funda One, at least for the in, or duration of the intervention, is to actually try and figure out um, what works and what does not work. And, what are the elements or components that are that one can able to scale up and, and other elements that possibly um, do not work well. So we really in a, I mean, I don't have a direct answer to your question, but just to, to share some of our thinking and discussions within the organization, um, we, we, we really just trying to figure out, you know, um, answer the question of what does it take? Or what does one need to be able to shift learning gains and improve teacher practice? teaching practices. Um, yeah. Thanks, Mabisa. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, throughout the webinar, we've also had a couple of uh, two poll questions. I think the first one got reset due to technical difficulties. Um, but uh, can we please see the results for the first poll uh, being shared with us? It's been shared.
Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So here we see that um, the, the uh, modules of the six that were evaluated that came up as people being very interested in were teaching decoding and teaching comprehension. I also recall that in the first um, round of the poll that um, closed, it was also teaching comprehension. And for this one, I think, um, does anyone have, just to swing it back to uh, um, Catherine Snow and Pamela Mason, does anyone have questions that they'd like to pose to them with regards to the Rhodes course and their evaluation? Okay. Um, I think I'll wait for people to type those in as well. And um, could you please then share the second one, the second poll? And this one uh, was is with regards to the um, RCT. And there, it's um, the question was, or the statement was, an RCT is considered the gold standard because it measures the effect of the intervention on a group. And I think for that one, I find um, Stephen Taylor's comment on it, um, I think I'll add that on here, in that he says that he found the poll on question two a bit strange and hard to an answer. An RCT does measure the effects on a group, and that is extremely valuable, but does it make it the gold standard? And I think here, yeah, um, what would be nice to have in discussion is that, you know, something that uh, was mentioned by the panelists is that the RCT not only measures the effect of a treatment um, on a group, but we also can mitigate against all other factors that might be systematically different between the groups. And so we get a much better evaluation result than what we would any other event intervention, one that's not experimental. So, so for that one, I think, yes, more information is needed in order uh, for this poll, but most people uh, said that they agreed with the statement. Um, I'd like to just throw a question that was posed by Ben, and I see Nick is also answering this, but I think it would be nice to answer it out loud in that with COVID-19 uh, and schools being closed and schools being closed uh, sequentially, what can interventions do? And for example, how can government um, help? Uh, how do we then, uh, what do we do to reduce the gaps that are created by the pandemic? And for this, I'd like Nick to comment on what can be done. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Novisa. Um, I think it's a, this is a challenge that we haven't totally figured out how to, um, how, to, how to answer for ourselves, apart from preparing learners to have work to do at home. Uh, just logistically, even Ben, you mentioned this topic of focusing on catch up. Uh, it's, uh, it looks like uh, for foundation phase kids for grade ones and grade twos, they're losing half the academic year. Uh, it's not going to be possible to teach an entire academic year in six months uh, or in five months. Um, and it looks like it's probably going to be a lot less than that. So it might be that we, uh, using a teaching at the right level logic, need to accept that for the next two years or the next two and a half years, uh, we can't just be following exactly what the curriculum is saying children are meant to be doing at different grades, but rather need to make sure that kids are actually going through the different milestones that they're meant to be going through. Uh, rather than just rushing to the next grade because we are in the next calendar year. Um, but I do think some level of catch up, whether it's afternoon classes or um, additional homework clubs or those sorts of things uh, will be required because there's no doubt that uh, children have fallen behind. Um, and for some, they fall below a critical threshold of being able to read, uh, which has obviously got much bigger uh, consequences for them. Um, Ravisa, just one other suggestion. I think that the attendees, they can also raise their hand and then we can just allow them to speak. Uh, so if we've got more time for questions, it might be possible that they can actually just say what their questions are, um, as long as we just keep everyone brief so that there's time to answer them as well. Okay, thanks. Okay, great. Um, yes, let's, let's do it that way. Does anyone have, could anyone who has a question raise their hand? 
Um, Nabisa, I've also just got one comment I wanted to make uh, in response to something Ben had mentioned, uh, which I think Kelly also touched on. Um, and this, it's the idea of are the impacts large enough um, and how can we improve the impacts? Uh, and I think that uh, we completely agree with you, Ben, that uh, these, the impacts, even though they're encouraging and positive and statistically significant, um, are not large enough to make up for the backlog that kids that are attending poor schools have when they're uh, at the end of grade three compared to where they need to be in order to uh, thrive and, and learn according to the curriculum. Um, but that being said, at least in South Africa, we don't have evidence of more successful programs. So the other programs that we do have, they're either not evaluated, uh, in which case we have no idea if they are successful or not, um, or they are only have qualitative evaluations, which is very difficult to know whether there's been significant um, gains in the underlying learning outcomes that we're interested in. So I think at the same time that we acknowledge they're not big enough, uh, we also need to accept that the only evidence we have in South Africa for, I would call them medium scale programs, so say 50 to 200 schools, uh, of improving learning outcomes are these structured pedagogy coaches, um, lesson plans, or uh, some level of lesson structure. Um, and yet, even though we know that, we're not implementing them. Uh, the government is not allocating significant resources to doing that. And I think that's something that I want to touch on at the, uh, touch on at the end. Um, and I also wonder if um, we, if we can also hear from, um, I think, um, I'm just looking at the list of participants. Um, there were a number of other people that have run interventions, both uh, like Room to Read in Limpopo um, or uh, the EGRS study. And Pumi's obviously mentioned uh, a lot of that research, but Yanli and Stephen, I think, are also on the call, um, as well as uh, some of the people that were involved in uh, on the ground in the Eastern Cape, so Zaza uh, and the different coaches, uh, I think it'll be useful to hear from them uh, what are some of their responses to the, uh, the different panelists and, and what's been said. Uh, because as much as this discussion is about point one, a lot of it is also about what do we know about literacy and ways of improving it uh, in South Africa, which is a much bigger conversation than just point one. We one player in that space. Uh, and I'd be interested to hear from some of the other um, some of the other people that are, are in it. Cool, thanks, thanks, Nick. I think maybe what we can do is just hand over to, uh, Zaza, if you want to just give a to give a response to because um, uh, I know you were both involved in the teaching of the Rhodes course and as well as the intervention. Um, so maybe we can hear from you there. Oh. Okay, so starting with the Rhodes course, I really appreciate. Um, what Catherine and Pamela has given as a response and what really, um, really came out for me is what we have also been uh, discussing about the length of the videos and um, how do we really get also the teachers who um, to be able to watch the, the videos and make use of them um, uh, regularly. So, um, and with, with the intervention, Right, I there was a there was a question about the subject advisors. Yes, um, Mbumi had responded to it, and I think also from our side as the interventions, it as the intervention, I, it is important for for any intervention to really um, contribute by working closely with the in, um, subject advisors. As you know, that um, the subject advisors in the Eastern Cape are also in part of them. Rhodes course. So that not only does it bring harmony to the implementation um, of any intervention, but also it, it's working towards really more and more subject advisors getting into um, and supporting the, the teachers that are on the field. So um, yeah, so that's, um, that's what I can say for now. I was trying to catch up on Ben's question and and really trying to work on really what, what, what can we do after COVID-19 um, to, to really support the teachers. So 
Yeah, I'm just taking it all in as I'm sure um, my colleagues here in the, or the team here in the Eastern Cape is. Thank you, Zaza. And um, Sarah, is it possible for us to get comment on you um, as the person who uh, teaches the Rhodes course and has been very involved in developing the Rhodes course uh, from the evaluate, uh, evaluation from Pamela and Catherine? Um, I think what I'd say firstly is, is how much we appreciate the quality of that evaluation. You know, it really gave us the kind of feedback that we can act on. Um, and um, obviously some of the things, um, you know, in some of the feedback we, we were aware of and, um, and, and already, um, you know, thinking about how, how we would respond, you know, how we could improve the course in relation to those, um, those perceived weaknesses. Um, but it's so helpful to have a, an objective outside view and, and one that is so well qualified and so measured in, in, in their response. So, you know, that's the first thing I would like to say is, is how much we appreciate, we appreciate that. And we're already looking at um, how we could improve the course. In fact, we're already um, using that information to write subsequent modules. Um, I'm not sure, um, Nangam, so what you would like me to comment on with regard to the, the actual um, course and the intervention. Um, please just guide me a bit there. Hi, sorry, no, I just, I just thought that maybe it would be, uh, you know, an awesome opportunity for you to share um, mm. your response to, to, to Catherine and Pamela's um, questions. But also I think, and we can use this opportunity because I see we've got about two or three minutes left of the session um, to also follow up on Nick's question to Yanneli as well as Stephen regards to um, the scalability and the sustainability of such programs um, okay. in the African education sector. Yeah. Nangam, so could I come in here and just say if there's the opportunity to talk about something, to add yeah. something. Um, the question arose about um, from the, the poll about decoding and comprehension. And we were asked if we had any questions um, for, for Pamela and, and Catherine with regard to that. And um, the question I have is that the, inter the, the, um, the study, the evaluation of the intervention um, seems to show that um, we're more successful with the decoding than we are with the comprehension. Though that may be because we're focusing on, you know, grade one and I mean, the, the results are for grade one and grade two at this moment. But for with other interven um, interventions in South Africa, I think it's also the case. And I wondered if um, Catherine and Pamela could comment on that and, um, and say, um, you know, what, what we could be doing to lay the foundations for comprehension early on. You know, I was thinking in terms of people things like oral language comprehension, vocabulary, and so on. Um, I don't know if Callie would like to comment on, on whether, whether my, whether my um, interpretation of the results is accurate or not. I, I, could, uh, I could take that, Sarah. I mean, I think those results precisely replicate the findings from almost all interventions done in the early years um, in school. That, and they reflect partly uh, the fact that decoding is indeed a teachable skill. So in order to improve decoding outcomes, what we need to do is give teachers uh, the, uh, the knowledge of how to teach it and provide them with materials that match that knowledge and that give the, the learners in the insights and the practice they need. And comprehension is a very different sort of accomplishment. It isn't a well-defined, uh, limited skill like decoding. It's, uh, it, it relies on knowledge of the world and knowledge of language and knowledge of uh, discourse uh, processes and knowledge of genre specifics and, and so many more uh, deep and unlimited domains. So I think, um, first of all, we have to expect this. 
Uh, but secondly, you're absolutely right. We really have to think about it and how to, how to address it because ultimately good decoders are not going to do for, for the society, for the economy, or for themselves what they need to do if they haven't also developed the comprehension skills. So the oral language skills are absolutely uh, the right powerful predictors of reading comprehension. And the good news is that that's true in whatever language, which is why I think it's very important in your um, EFL, EFAL um, module to, to focus on the value of home language knowledge and developing vocabulary and a knowledge base in the home language, because that is precisely what does transfer, whereas the decoding skills might or might not transfer depending on how, they, how they're taught. And um, if I could add um, to that in terms of um, learners that, you know, sometimes when we're thinking about decoding, especially um, in English and we get to word families, what the students can read and that what it, how it makes sense is a little bit of a disconnect. So that really the teachers need to understand that the decoding is in service of language comprehension. And so you can even talk about, you know, why some of the sentences that may be including phonically quote regular words don't make sense. And so then you have students really seeing the connection between, you know, why they're learning how to decode and that in fact it is to support the meaningful interpretation of text. And when text doesn't make sense then you can have an oral language discussion about what are the disconnects so that they're always in that thinking mode that okay, this is helping me to make sense out of what I'm reading. And I think that's important for the teachers to emphasize with their learners as well. Um, just, just to add to that as well, um, one of the things that we measure is um, listening comprehension um, and even there we see um, particularly if questions if one moves from very straightforward literal questions to something more inferential many of the learners um, are battling with those questions to you and we did see with the grade one learners an improvement in um, oral listening comprehension um, over the year um, so yeah, I just wanted to add Thank you. And thank you to our speakers. Um, I see now is the time where we wrap up the Q&A. Uh, for anyone who is on the Zoom chat, the um, chat, the webinar chat room is also a good reference to go at and read through the comments there. Now, I now hand over to Nick, who will then be closing the um, webinar. Thanks, uh, Novisa. Um, I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Um, can everyone see just the, the red slide in service training? Yes. yes. Great. So just a, a final comment. I've just got two slides here. Um, but something that I think is coming up, and it's come up not only in Fondoanda, but in a lot of organizations, both in South Africa and in other developing country contexts, uh, is that there's mounting local and international evidence of what it takes to shift teachers' practice and improve reading outcomes in very challenging contexts, sometimes with very large class sizes, uh, and, and in many instances with teachers that don't have high levels of content knowledge uh, or professional training, uh, and yet it is still possible to move the literacy outcomes of their learners. And that requires, uh, as Ben has mentioned in the chat, uh, structured pedagogy, which, which has coaches, uh, uh, good materials, and lesson planning or structure. Now, the fact that we know that information, uh, and Seppel mentioned that the president has said that uh, reading is a priority for the national government as well as for the Department of Basic Education. I think we need to ask uh, the question, why is there so little government expenditure that's going into things like um, the early grade reading study or scaling up initiatives that are specifically using expert coaches, uh, good materials and lesson planning and structure. So I think it's fair to ask a question going forward when we want to say, how can we improve the reading outcomes of learners in South Africa? 
to say what percentage of provincial and national discretionary budgets are being spent on these proven interventions. And we accept that they aren't yielding the, the levels of gains that we want, yet they are still the largest gains that we are able to generate uh, from South African interventions. Uh, so I've put there, the answer is definitely less than 1%. Uh, I mean, I, we have many DBE colleagues uh, on the, uh, in the call and feel free to, um, to just share information if that's incorrect. I think instead budgets are spent on technology. So we've just seen this in the Eastern Cape uh, with the, the rollout of tech to matric learners, but we also saw it with the rollout of laptops uh, to teachers, light touch programs that lack evaluations. I think most of the next programs uh, that have been done don't have rigorous evaluations that show whether or not learning outcomes are improving or not. And yes, they reach millions of children, but it's unclear whether the learning outcomes of those children are improving as a result of the intervention. I think that things like the fourth industrial revolution, introducing additional languages like Kiswahili, uh, which Ben, this is not, uh, we're not talking about Kenya in this context, we're actually talking about South Africa, uh, coding for foundation phase learners. There's a lot of things that uh, if you look at the evidence just seem crazy, uh, to be honest, uh, that the department chooses to focus and spend money on things that are not evidence-based and do not lead to improvements in reading outcomes. And yet they don't allocate budget towards things that have evidence to show that they do improve. And I think that it's fair to ask the question, why is that the case uh, and how can we change that? The second question is on pre-service training. Uh, so existing audits of pre-service and in-service courses show that there's an insufficient focus on African languages uh, and specifically the pedagogies of teaching. Uh, why has there been little action in response to those audits? Uh, so the ITREP study that JET did showed that pre-service teacher education uh, spends less than half of the, the time available for a foundation phase teacher's training on the practicalities of how you actually teach reading uh, and maths and numeracy. Uh, so the actual pedagogical practices, things like linguistics, classroom management, assessment, um, these things make up less than half of the credits that are required to become a foundation phase teacher in South Africa. In one university, it was less than 6%. And I think that the Mr. Tech uh, regulations are a step in the right direction, but it's clearly not far enough. Um, so I wanted to leave us all with this question of what will it take for us to shift universities and their courses, credits, and expertise towards the realities and the practicalities of how to teach reading? Uh, it's not saying that we need to abolish courses and that we shouldn't have courses on becoming a professional or uh, doing research in education or about the philosophy of education. It's just saying that we need to increase the weight and importance of the practicalities uh, of teaching because those are currently underemphasized. Um, so I'm hoping that the, the presentation today uh, by the different speakers, thanks to all of our speakers for uh, the time that they put into doing the presentations. I think that we learned a lot from them. Um, they're very helpful. And as we said, we encourage everyone to look at the evaluation reports that are on the Funda One Day website uh, for anyone to download and look at. Uh, a special thanks to Phoebe and to Nangamso um, who've organized the webinar and managed all of the logistics of it. I think it's been a great webinar and run really smoothly. So thank you both uh, to both of you uh, and to all our panelists for taking the time out to uh, spend time with us whether it's five in the morning uh, or lunchtime, wherever you are around the world. Uh, and I think we would like to make this a regular uh, type of thing of doing webinars when we do have evaluation reports and results. Because this is an ongoing program, there would be uh, these independent evaluations at the different milestones. So I'd just like to say thanks to everyone. We will make this recording available on our YouTube channel for those that couldn't make it. Uh, and uh, Nangamsa will also send out an email with the, the reports and the recording uh, to everyone that RSVP'd. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us um, and yeah, look forward to seeing you next time. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Thanks, thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks everyone. Thanks Bumi. Step for Ben, Pamela, and Catherine.